I'm back with another monster ranking for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. This time we'll be taking a look at constructs. These are creatures that are built rather than born. Commonly they are made from stone or metal, but really almost any kind of substance can be used. From wood, to clay, to carpet, even flesh and bone. It must have been the wind! Constructs are often made with a two-step process. The first involves fashioning the physical form of the creature, so sculpting, engineering, or the like. The second part has to do with animating the creature, imbuing it with some force that gives it the ability to move about, to obey instructions, to fight. The more advanced constructs go even farther beyond this. They actually possess their own spirits or souls, and a surprising degree of sentience. As usual, I'll be rating each monster in the areas of mechanics, style, role-playing, lore, and versatility, with tiebreakers simply based on my own best judgment or my own preference. Before delving into the entries, I want to say that I suspect constructs overall are going to rate low in role-playing and versatility. This is due to the fact that lots of them are not sentient, they cannot speak, they merely follow basic orders or repetitive patterns of behavior. At this point, we are seven years into 5e, and we still have only three main bestiary books. The Monster Manual, Volo's Guide to Monsters, and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. If you are hungry for additional beasts and intriguing rivals for your own game, make sure to check out my Kickstarter for Esper's Emporium of Esoterica, my long-awaited 5e book. This is a grand project of mine that draws upon all the lessons I've learned from reviewing and DMing D&D for years. The monsters have unique and dynamic abilities that really spice up combat, and their lore is written to lead to storytelling and adventure hooks. Along with the monsters, the book contains a bunch of other content for players and DMs alike. My original class, the Paragon, new spells, magic items, subclasses, traps, magic shops, cursed items, and so much more. Check out the link down in the video description. Now let's step into the Artificer's Workshop, unseal the Creation Chamber, and see what stony guardians come lumbering out. F-tier monsters are few and far between. They represent the creatures that either suffer from very poor design, or they're just creatures that are very, very simple. In the case of Constructs, it's the latter. The Flying Sword is thematically cool, and it's decently effective at what it does. But in the end, it's just a simple animated object. It reminds me of the Dancing Scimitar card from Magic's Arabian Nights set. It also makes me think of the Book of Genesis, when God expels Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and appoints cherubim and a flaming sword that flies and flashes there in order to guard the way to the Tree of Life. If only we had such rich lore connected to the Flying Sword, but instead it's just an object imbued with magic that makes a basic attack over and over. For its low, low CR of one quarter, it does have a good AC, fast flying, blind sight, and decent damage. And that is all for F tier. Now we move up a notch to creatures that have a little bit more going on with them. The Rug of Smothering is the cousin of the Flying Sword, and it shares many of its same qualities. What makes it slightly more interesting is its unique attack, which it wraps itself about its target's head, grappling, blinding, and suffocating the creature, as well as dealing constricting damage at the start of each of the target's turns. Furthermore, whenever the rug takes damage while it's wrapped onto a creature, it only takes half the damage and the other half goes to that grappled creature. Dark Mantles also have a similar damage transfer trait, by the way. Another noteworthy trait is False Appearance, which means that the creature appears as just a normal rug while it's motionless, giving it a great chance to surprise attack adventurers. Otherwise, the rug itself moves very slowly and has low AC and low hit points, so parties should have plenty of options to defeat it. While the rug suffers from all the simplistic shortcomings and limitations as the flying sword, at least it does have a little bit more going on in terms of mechanics. Now we arrive at the Modrons, creatures that I admit I hated when I first saw them. They looked like something out of a Pixar kids movie, and their mechanical lack of personality and 
lack of human complexity was just boring to me. Part of me wanted to give the Monodrone a one in style because to me they just clash so harshly with a believable medieval type setting. But in the spirit of being open-minded, I have to admit that in an ultra-high magic setting, I could see myself finding a way to implement them. So in the great cosmology of standard D&D, there is a plane of existence for everything. There's the Feywild for dreams and fairies, the Shadowfell for nightmares and scary things. There is a plane for each of the alignments, such as Elysium for neutral good and Limbo for chaotic neutral. The clockwork nirvana of Mechanus, uh, Mechanus, uh, is the lawful neutral plane. And there dwell the Modrons, mechanical beings that live in a synchronized hive, who carry out precise duties and all unwaveringly follow the laws and axioms of their kind. Does that sound a little on the boring side? It's because it is. When things go too far to the extreme on any one side, it gets less interesting because it's difficult to create stories and characters that are one-dimensional. Stories are mainly composed of conflict, and conflict occurs when there are multiple dimensions grappling with each other. So back to the Modron. It is a one-eyed, medium-sized construct with a tiny bit of intelligence. It can carry out one simple task at a time and communicate on one subject for a very short amount of time. It can fly, attack with a dagger or javelin, and it disintegrates to rust if slain, which is extremely likely due to its super low 5 HP. It's essentially the kobold of constructs, though less interesting and a little more cartoonish. It also has 120 feet of true sight, which is extremely rare for such a low CR monster, but I suppose it reflects their absolutely lawful nature. They can see through any alterations or illusions. There's one final note that does offer a hint of potential for more interesting storytelling, which you can probably guess what it is, that in certain cases a modern becomes defective and goes rogue. It loses its axiomatic mind, ceases to obey the will of Primus, the grand leader of Mechanus, and it is to be hunted down and destroyed by other moderns. Moving up a tiny tick is the Duo Drone, which can handle doing two different tasks. They are supervisors of the Monodrones in the Modron hierarchy. Mechanically, they are like the Monodrones, except they can't fly, though they can make two attacks with their multi attack. The next rank of Modron is the Tri Drone, which you guessed it has three sides, actually, three faces each one on one side of its body it resembles an upside down pyramid. They are slightly more intelligent, like that of a not so bright human, and they can make three attacks with their multi-attack. I will say that I do like the aesthetic of this modern a bit more than the others. It reminds me of something I saw as a kid, but I can't put my finger on it. It's a creature from like Alice in Wonderland or Gulliver's Travels. Neverending Story, maybe some cartoon? I don't know. If you have any idea, please let me know. The Quadrone is about as smart as an average human, and it has four um, sides per face of its cube body. I don't get it. The Duo Drone is two cubes. Anyhow, the Quadrone gets back to flying, and this time it's equipped with a short bow that makes four attacks. Ah, there we go. So this creature does represent a slight bit of tactical challenge, as it will try to keep out of the reach of melee characters and present a kind of mobile, multi-elevation shootout. In modern society, they serve as artillery and low-level military officers. The Pentadrones are the overseers in the clockwork nirvana of Mechanus. They are large-sized modrons that have five arms, each of which bears a face. In combat, they can make five arm slam attacks, as well as exhale a 30-foot cone of paralyzing gas. Now, most constructs in D&D can't be paralyzed, as paralysis in general seems to be a condition associated with living organic creatures that have nervous systems, but the Modrons are an exception, as somehow they are susceptible to paralysis. 
It's also worth noting that this is one of the few low CR creatures to have more than two attacks on its multi-attack. At a mere CR2, this creature can make five attacks, each dealing 1d6 plus 2 bludgeoning damage, for a maximum total of 5d6 plus 10 damage, which is quite a lot for a level 1 or 2 character. So, in a sense, this functions as the Hydra or the Merilith of low-level play, and perhaps teaching an early lesson about the dangers of going into melee with creatures that can make several attacks in one round. That is it for the Modrons. Until 5e can come up with something more interesting in their lore, I feel a low amount of motivation to work with these monotonous creatures. Like the flying sword in the Rug of Smothering, the animated armor is a kind of animated object. I like this one a bit better than the others for a couple of reasons. First is that I just like seeing a suit of armor moving about on its own. It gives me nostalgia of books and movies and cartoons from my childhood where there were animated suits of armor in enchanted castles and haunted mansions. It strikes a nice balance between cool and creepy, fantasy and reality. The second thing that I like is this little paragraph from the Monster Manual entry. To add to its menace, animated armor is frequently enchanted with scripted speech, so the armor can utter warnings, demand passwords, and deliver riddles. Rare suits of animated armor are able to carry on an actual conversation. So whether the armor just delivers a pre-scripted phrase, or actually can hold a simple dialogue, it's something that does engage the characters, and it adds personality to a location. A shield guardian is a construct of metal and magic whose sole purpose is to serve its master, primarily by defending him from harm. A shield guardian is attuned to a magical amulet, and whoever possesses said amulet is able to telepathically control the creature. While within 60 feet of its master, the shield guardian takes half of all the damage that the master takes, and it has 142 hit points and regeneration 10. It can also add 2 to the master's AC against a single attack as a reaction, as long as it's within 5 feet. Defensive traits are an incredible advantage for an NPC or even a character, aside from the fact that the construct can serve as a laborer and make two fist attacks per turn in combat. To make things even better, the shield guardian can store a single spell up to fourth level that the master loads into it, and it unleashes said spell when the master commands it so, or when a certain predetermined trigger occurs. So mechanically speaking, a shield guardian completely alters how the master's opponents must approach him in battle. On the downside, if you can get that amulet away from the master, it's fragile and very easy to destroy and to replace it takes a week of work and 1,000 GP worth of magical components. Or even better, just put the amulet on, as simply wearing the thing makes the shield guardian immediately consider you to be its master. It doesn't even require attunement. Honestly, this part doesn't make much sense to me. Why would a spellcaster spend so much time and resources at the effort of creating an amazing defender yet it can just be taken away and even used against him within a matter of seconds. He gets completely ruined by a thief that snatches away the amulet, or a warrior that wrestles him to the ground and strips it away. Who would commission the creation of such a guardian knowing that it has this glaring liability? There are plenty of other constructs that also can act as guardians, and none of them have this flaw. I can understand that the game designers probably thought it would be a cool challenge for the characters to try to steal the amulet, but at least make the amulet require attunement, as this would not instantly alter the shield guardian because you would need to take a short rest in order to attune to the magic item. Also, having it cost an attunement slot would slightly help balance out the absurd value of gaining a shield guardian. This would be the equivalent of, what, a legendary item? A level 12 character as your ally? It's a great concept, but the execution has some major issues that I think need addressing. The Helmed Horror is something like an upgraded animated armor. It's stronger, with higher HP and a more powerful attack, and the ability to fly, magic resistance, resistance to non-magical weapons, and immunity to any three spells selected by its creator. 
It also possesses a surprisingly high level of intelligence, though it cannot speak, nor is it cunning enough to alter or fortify its surrounding environment. Also, quite interestingly, the Helmed Horror has immunity to force damage and being stunned. Both of those are extremely rare. The spell immunity really strikes me. The trait reads as though the three spells are chosen when the Helmed Horror is created and cannot be changed later, but it's not entirely clear. Let's see if good old Wizards of the Coast has an official word on this. Apparently not. So, perhaps if the creator is a rival or an enemy of the characters, he can spy on them first or maybe hire an informant, thus creating the Helmed Horror with the perfect three spells to be immune to. The Monster Manual unfortunately doesn't specify how long it takes to create a Helmed Horror, how much they cost in materials or components, if any certain spells or successful skill checks are required. It seems that after 3E, all constructs are largely missing this information, so DMs, just figure something out that makes sense in your own worlds. It's also kind of crazy how this monster gets full-on immunity to any three spells. The example selections given are Fireball, Heat Metal, and Lightning Bolt, which are nice choices. But again, any three spells like even ninth level spells. It just seems like a lot. But anyway, probably my favorite thing about this monster is its aesthetic. I actually talked about it in my recent video about 5e illustrations that have done certain monsters better than ever. The Helmed Horror has always looked really cool. It's menacing, eerie, even kind of exotic. It's kind of sinister too. Well, horror is in its name after all. I really wish I could give this monster a higher position in this ranking. If only it had, like, one more unique ability, a touch of intriguing lore, some way to actually interact more with the characters. Ugh, how many times have I said that about a creature? A Steel Predator is a large, beast-shaped animate made of metal. It's built to seek out and assassinate targets. It can dimension door and plane shift itself three times per day each. It has a bunch of resistances and immunities, including immunity against non-magical weapons and the incredibly rare immunity to being stunned. It itself has a stunning roar ability that affects a 60-foot cone, dealing 5d10 thunder damage and causing creatures to drop whatever they're holding and get stunned for one minute. As to who makes this CR-16 planes hopping death tiger, it is none other than a rogue Modron who dwells within the interplanar hub city of Sigil. The Monster Manual does not name this Modron, only referring to it as an ingenious Hexton who was originally praised for its creations, but then turned rogue and sent its creations to kill other Modrons that had higher ranks. This rogue artificer Modron was trapped and exiled from Mechanus, and to this day dwells in Sigil, where clients can hire its mechanical assassins for very steep prices. So I'm torn on the Steel Predator. It has some great mechanics, and it does have some lore, but this lore leaves us with even more questions and some apparent plot holes. How did a Sexton Modron create a powerful CR-16 construct. Maybe it itself leveled up in the Artificer class all the way to level 20, or it's some kind of very special high-powered NPC? I guess it would have to be, because following the Monster Manual, a Sexton itself would be a CR-3, so it making Steel Predators would be like a level 5 character constructing level 24 characters. Did it somehow find a way to advance itself far beyond the typical limitations of a modron? How did it manage to acquire the extremely expensive components and materials that it would require to construct steel predators? I'm sure they're not just made of literally regular steel. When this rogue artificer modron was trapped by the other modrons back on Mechanus, why didn't they just kill it? Or why didn't Primus seal the rogue Modron in the most advanced prison on Mechanus and then extract the knowledge of how to make steel predators from it? Why exile? That would be like when they caught Ted Bundy, they just turned him loose in Tokyo. 
Another great question is how can a DM appropriately use this monster? I mean, if it is utilized in the way that its lore reads, some villain of the character's party would contract the Steel Predator in secret, and it would just appear out of nowhere and murder one or more of the characters, then disappear again. This is actually part of a bigger problem in D&D, which is how to actually use assassins against the party without the players getting frustrated and pissed off. So this tangent could keep going and going, and I admit these questions all could have legitimate answers, great answers, especially if there was some kind of secret conspiracy going on with the nameless rogue Sexton Modron. But in true 5e style, everything is left vague and underdeveloped, and the DM has a lot of blanks to fill in. This isn't a bad thing in and of itself, but it just gets old when the vast majority of the lore goes this way. Stonecursed are people who are subjected to an alchemical ritual that petrifies them and turns them into stony servants and guards that loyally serve their creator. They are reminiscent of undead in many ways, but technically they are constructs. The claws of a stone cursed drip with an alchemical sludge that can petrify those it strikes. This is a standard sort of petrification, and it can last up to only 24 hours. It does not create more stone cursed, only the magical ritual can do that. A further intriguing detail about the stone cursed is the ritual that creates them causes a small obsidian skull to form within them. When the stone cursed is slain, its form shatters, and it reveals this obsidian skull. Some of the original victim's memories linger within the skull. Not their soul, just a bit of memory. And a character can attempt a DC-20 arcana check at the end of a short rest in order to ask the skull a question and try to receive a corresponding memory from the victim. In battle, a stone cursed attacks with a claw attack that can deal a high amount of damage for just a CR1 along with that chance to restrain or even petrify the target for 24 hours. Though the odd thing is that at low levels, this creature can knock out or kill characters much more readily than petrify them, which is a little odd because the petrification effect seems like that would be the main thing with this monster. The Stone Curse does have a relatively high AC of 17, but its hit points are a little on the low side, only 19. Its major weaknesses, though, are its abysmal speed of only 10 feet, its terrible dexterity, and its vulnerability to bludgeoning damage. Like with oozes, this creature can be very dangerous if you walk into its reach, but otherwise, once you're aware of the thing, you just stay back, and it might not ever even be able to reach you. You just shoot and blast it into oblivion. In a nutshell, I'd say that I like the Stone Cursed's concept, but I have some misgivings about its mechanics, as it's torn between being a petrifier, which is a control monster, and a sneak attacker, which is like a stealth assassination monster. I'm not saying that a monster or a character can't be more than one thing. I'm just saying that if you try to cram both of those effects into one single primary attack, it's awkward. And that brings us to the end of D tier. It's already clear that constructs, by and large, suffer from their lack of sentience. Of course, a non-sentient, emotionless chunk of walking stone is what defines most constructs. So my intention is not for this to be a gripe. We simply have to accept the fact that most constructs are never going to be more than tools that serve their masters. There are some big limitations with them, but the limitations actually help define what the constructs are. Moving into C tier, we come across a bunch of constructs. The Hall of Stone, the Corridor of Iron, the Chambers of Artifice itself is where we are now treading. And as we will see, a lot of constructs were falling into C tier. They combine some decently cool abilities and aesthetics with the narrow potential for role-playing and storytelling. The homunculus is sort of like a familiar. It's a tiny-sized servant that has a telepathic bond with the magic user who created it. It can serve as a spy, a scout, a messenger, a servant. Whereas familiars are spirits in the form of little animals, a homunculus is a construct. It's made out of clay, ash, mandrake root, and a bit of the creator's own blood. 
An arcane ritual gives the creature animation and sentience, which breaks through that consciousness limitation that most constructs have. But the homunculus cannot speak, so still its interactions with player characters will be limited, and its master controls it as though an extension of himself, so its versatility still is lacking. Combine this with limited and generalized lore, and the creature is going to be stuck in the mid-tiers. Of course, a DM can make exceptions and craft an interesting story that gives something more to an adventure that features a homunculus, but that is purely the DM's own creativity and work, not anything in the official book that I can rate. The homunculus reminds me a little bit of the imp. It's this tiny flying thing with a humanoid-like body and a poisonous attack. The imp is a little stronger in combat, with its higher damage and at-will invisibility. The homunculus is CR0, and only deals one damage. Its poison imparts the poisoned condition for a minute, or if the target rolls a 5 or lower on its con save, 1d10 minutes, along with unconsciousness. Dwarves are sometimes associated with constructs, which makes sense as they are master stoneworkers, craftsmen, smiths, and miners. The evil deep dwarves are known as this, which I've heard pronounced in a bunch of different ways, from Dwergar to Dwerger to Durgar to the Swedish Dvirgur. D&D Beyond's official pronunciation is Durgar. So that all confuzzles me a bit, and feel free to leave a comment telling me how I'm wrong, you wankas. Dwergars are a bitter and callous race that hates basically everyone. They hate other kinds of dwarves and the standard dwarven pantheon. They hate the drow and lolth, and they especially hate mind flayers who, you guessed it, once enslaved them and performed psionic experiments upon them. Dwergar are associated with devils, Asmodeus to be specific, the lord of hell, and they carry out twisted experiments on their own kind. One such result is the Dwergar Hammerer, which is a construct with a living Dwergar locked into its core. This poor sod is typically a disobedient or lazy worker who then gets condemned into a mechanical suit that is fueled by his own pain and torment. The Hammerer functions as a digging machine, a siege engine, and a soldier. This is also another monster that had a mini in 3E, this time the Blood War set. The Hammerer was actually from a monster manual. It was an automaton in Monster Manual 2, described as being built with clockwork parts. The 5E Dwergar Hammerer from Mordenkainen's Tome is quite straightforward mechanically, attacking with a hammer hand that bludgeons and a claw hand that bludgeons. Hmm, no grab, no nothing. When you attack a hammerer, you can choose to aim for the living Dwergar trapped inside. If you do so, your attack has disadvantage, and if you hit, you deal additional damage. But the hammerer then makes an immediate multi-attack against you as a reaction, as its engine gets a spike of power from the Dwergar's pain. Much like the hammerer, the screamer is a construct being powered by the torment of a living Dwergar locked inside. This time, the condemned soul is someone who spread treasonous rumors or disparaging gossip amongst the Dwergar community. Also, like the hammerer, it serves in both labor and combat. It has a drill and a sonic scream that can pulverize rock as well as assault foes. And it also has that same engine of pain trait like the hammerer, in which attackers can target the dwarf inside. I think that both of these Dwergar constructs are pretty damn cool style-wise, with the concept of a condemned and tormented dwarf locked in their core, and they are these tunneling machines slash mechanical soldiers. They also have some decent potential story-wise, if we consider the implications of all that goes into the creation of such a construct, plus the connections to all the Dwergar and dwarf lore that's in the game, but their limitations are fairly steep, with few abilities, very little social interaction, and a repetitive narrowness to their behavior. And now we come to golems, one of the most iconic types of constructs, perhaps the most iconic. The origin of the golem comes from Jewish folklore, which described them in much the same way as we know them today, inorganic material given animation. 
This definition blurs a bit when we get to the flesh golem, but hold that thought for now. These creatures have big, powerful bodies built out of stone, iron, clay, or other substances. Often in much the same way, a master sculptor would craft a big statue. What powers golems are elemental spirits bound into the bodies through expensive and powerful magical rituals. These spirits are not entire souls, but rather an animating energy and a small spark of intelligence that allows the golems to understand and at least obey basic commands. As ageless and solid as the earth, a stone golem is a defender chiseled from hard rock. It is large size, immune to poison, psychic, and weapons that are not magic or weapons that are not adamantine. It has magic resistance, two powerful slam attacks, and a slowing effect similar to the slow spell. Its body is most commonly formed in a humanoid shape, like a giant warrior or guardian, but there are no restrictions over this, so you could come across a stone golem shaped like an animal, a monster, just about anything. The stone golem really is the most classic construct that I can think of. So great in its own way. Its major issue, of course, is that it has zero personality. It's just a chunk of rock that will pummel you. If you want something sort of like a stone golem but with sentience and more depth, check out the Mog from 3E. The cousin of the stone golem is the iron golem, which is the same concept but just a bit stronger and tougher. It could possibly take inspiration from the Colossus of Rhodes from ancient Greece, or Talos, the giant bronze automaton from Greek mythology. In 5 ED and D, the Iron Golem has a high AC and the same immunities as the Stone Golem, plus it has fire absorption, which means it heals from fire instead of taking damage. It has a slam and a sword attack, as well as a potent cone of poison breath. Really that fire absorption is the kicker, I'd say. If the Iron Golem is in a chamber that has fiery features such as lava or permanent walls of fire, it could be extremely difficult to defeat. The other cousin of the Stone Golem is the Clay Golem, which is strong, but not quite as strong as stone or iron. These golems are associated with divine power, as they are commonly imbued by a priest and given a task that serves a temple or religious goal, again hearkening back to the golem's roots in ancient Jewish lore. The clay golem has the various immunities like a fire golem, except acid absorption instead of fire absorption. I'm imagining a secret dungeon underneath a temple, which contains an acid pit that both disposes the bodies of heretics and rejuvenates the protector golem. The golem also has a haste effect similar to the haste spell that it applies just to the golem itself, and it only lasts until the end of its next turn. Being that clay is a less stable substance than stone or iron, there is a chance that a highly damaged clay golem will go berserk, in which case it will attack whatever creature is nearest to it, anyone, ally or foe. Failing that, if there's no one nearby, it will just attack whatever object is nearest to it. It continues berserking until it is destroyed or regains all of its hit points. Now we come to the clockwork constructs, starting with the Iron Cobra. These are the creations of gnome engineers, a long-running gnomish tradition of creating mechanical guardians. In true gnome spirit, they value originality and inventiveness just as much or even more so than functionality. This penchant for tinkering gives the clockworks a couple of customization tables, one for enhancements and one for malfunctions, which I think is just great. If there's something that I love, it's random tables. I create and use lots of them myself, as they bring a sense of excitement and magic into the game. The Iron Cobra is a metal snake with expertise in stealth, and a bite that delivers one of the following randomized poison effects. 3d8 poison damage, or confusion that can cause the target to attack a random creature, or paralysis. Like all clockworks, the Iron Cobra has magic resistance and a number of immunities, including immunity to damage that is neither magical nor adamantine. Clockworks understand one of their creator's languages, but they cannot speak, except for the one enhancement on the enhancement table. The Stone Defender, as its name states, is a bodyguard made mostly of stone. 
It has a slam attack that knocks large and smaller targets to the ground. It can camouflage itself against rocks and stone walls, and it can block attacks against creatures next to it. The Bronze Scout has a worm or centipede-styled body. It burrows through the ground, using the dirt to keep itself protected. It has expertise in perception and stealth, a bite attack, and once per rest it can do a pulse of lightning. Do keep in mind that unless a monster's entry says so, it cannot burrow through solid rock. Just looser substances like dirt, sand, ice, and the like. So I imagine bronze scouts patrolling just under the forest floor. Perhaps gnome tunnels that are in dirt. It uses its telescopic eyes to pop up discreetly here and there and look out for intruders while keeping its body itself fully under the dirt. The Oaken Bolter is a repurposing of the old Arcane Ballista from the 3rd edition D&D miniatures set, War Drums. I don't think it ever made it into an actual monster manual back then, but its stats were on the card. Yes, the minis used to come with cards that had the monster's stat blocks. I seem to remember a Chris Perkins 4E adventure in which there were Arcane Ballistas, but I also don't remember them from any monster manual, so they were probably just something of his own design. So now the Oaken Bolter has been shrunk down to medium size from the large sized Arcane Ballista. It is a bit awkward because the miniature for it is large size. It fires bolts at a range, the same as a heavy crossbow, or shoots with a harpoon, which I quite like, by the way. It also has an explosive bolt that works like a less powerful fireball. Overall, I like the clockworks quite a bit. They're about everything that I want from a mid-tier group of constructs. I suppose I only have one major criticism about them, and it's that damage immunity that they have. As I mentioned before, unless you hit them with a magic weapon or an adamantine weapon, they're going to be immune to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. The problem is how that's a bit awkward on a CR5 or lower monster. This means that if the weapons-based characters don't have magic weapons or adamantine, which they really might not in the first tier of play, they do zero damage. That is a massively strong defense on the monster's part. However, due to the way that monster creation works in 5th edition, these clockworks actually have low hit points for their CR. So if the characters do have magic or adamantine weapons, or if they just use magical assaults only, like spellcasting, they're just going to smash the clockworks really easily. It also means that the clockworks become substantially underpowered if used against high-level characters. Honestly, it just highlights yet again some of my dislikes of 5e's approach to monster creation. It's not a bad monster creation system, but sometimes it feels backwards, and I wish it would have been done differently. Well, let's move along. Move along. Move along. The Scarecrow begins as a regular Scarecrow, which is subjected to a dark ritual that binds an evil spirit into it. As with most constructs, the mage who creates the Scarecrow becomes its master. Examples include a hag binding a demon spirit into a Scarecrow, or a warlock sending the soul of a murderer into a Scarecrow to do his grisly bidding. The Scarecrow monster itself is easy to strike. It has a low AC of 11, and of course it has vulnerability to fire. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? But it resists non-magical weapons. It attacks with two claw attacks which deal slashing damage and inflict the frightened condition on the target if it fails a wisdom saving throw. It also has a terrifying glare which can paralyze a single target with fear. Chaotic Evil does not seem to be the correct alignment for the Scarecrow, as it's an obedient creature and it's one that's known to spend great amounts of time holding still, waiting, being patient I suppose we'd call that. In fact, it's the only construct from the main 5e bestiaries that is chaotic of any kind. I guess we could count Warforged as potentially chaotic, they are free-willed, sentient people, but even then, that's very rare. It just does not make sense to build constructs that are erratic, uncontrollable, and rebellious. Oh wait, I just found some chaotic constructs. Piggly Wiggly Butt? 
Buster the Bear? What the hell? Oh. The Scarecrow was a classic spooky figure and it contains enough story potential to give it some interesting adventure hooks. Perhaps something like The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which combines an eerie atmosphere and a mystery to solve, dark magical forces to contend with, some kind of puppet master that's lurking about. Retrievers are high-powered spider-like constructs created by Drow. Their primary function is to hunt demons in the abyss and bring them back to Drow masters for magical experimentations and ritual. Sometimes retrievers are used in the world to fetch people or objects, and on extremely rare occasion, Drow sell a retriever to an outsider. What powers a retriever is the soul of a bebelith, which is a huge spider-like demon that as of yet has not received a 5e version. A retriever has a decently high AC and hit points, a 40 foot speed and a climb speed, proficiency in the three most common saving throws, immunity to necrotic, poison, psychic, non-magical weapons and non-adamantine weapons, it has blind sight of 30 feet, and the faultless tracker feature which allows it to know the direction and distance of any kind of quarry. Three times per day, it can innately cast web and plane shift, along with the option to automatically take one incapacitated creature with it. Its multi-attack includes two four-leg slashes, and either a beam that deals 5d10 force damage, or a paralyzing beam with a solid DC of 18. It's a strong monster, though what's missing are traits that specifically help it defeat demons, which you would think we would find with a creature whose primary purpose is abyssal abductions. Its immunities will help it withstand the attacks of most lesser and mid-powered demons, but ironically, the retriever itself doesn't have magical weapon attacks in order to get past the resistance to non-magical weapons that a lot of demons have. The Retriever should have some kind of trait that gives it magical natural weapons and an increase to damage against demons, or some other such trait along those lines being that they're specifically designed to defeat demons. I suppose this is a lesser criticism as the Retriever overall has some great mechanics and a compelling theme. The only major shortcoming that I find with this monster is, of course, non-existent role-playing. Coming to us straight from Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory is the Flesh Golem. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Is it an undead? Well, not exactly. It is composed of body parts that are sewn and bolted together, though the elemental spirit that's animating it is not undead and I don't believe any actual necromancy is involved in the creation process, so it's hard to say, but D&D has always stuck to it being a construct, so I'll go with that. This golem is a little more intelligent than the typical ones, and if you've ever watched the old Universal Studios Frankenstein movies, you'll have an idea of what I'm talking about. It's tragic how the monster has an almost childlike innocence to it, yet it gets easily provoked to violence when threatened by the society that viciously rejects it. This gets expressed by the Flesh Golem's Berserk trait in D&D. It's much like the Clay Golem's Berserk. It has the addition that the Flesh Golem's creator can attempt to calm it down. It also has an aversion to fire, like what we see in the old Frankenstein flicks. Otherwise, it has the immunities, resistances, and slam attacks like we saw in the other Golems. Plus, Lightning absorption. Raise the lightning rod, Igor! I can think of no better way to cap off C tier than with the flesh golem. Now we progress to the more advanced sector of the artificer's workshop, B tier, where things get even more interesting. The Marut is one of the inevitables, which have not been featured much in 5e, not so far. They are creations of Primus himself, the grand overlord of the clockwork nirvana of Mechanus. The Inevitables are enforcers of great contracts throughout the plains, most notably in the Hall of Concordance and Sigil. If you're not familiar with Sigil, the City of Doors, the simplified version is that it is a hub demiplane, a city that exists in the form of a looping tube that connects to all other planes. 
In Sigil, you can basically find anything, meet anyone, and get anywhere, as long as you have the resources and the guile. When you want a contract written in stone, actually in gold, and enforced to the very letter, you go to the Inevitables and in Sigil. The Kalia route oversees the administration of justice, and the contract, etched in gold, is archived within a Marut. If the contract is not followed in the most literal, word-for-word -word fashion possible, the Marut will track down the offending party and put some pressure on. As a being of pure law, the Marut will attack only on certain conditions. If the contract stipulates that it has to attack, for example, or if the contract is just outright completely broken and defiled, or if the Marut itself must defend itself from attackers. At this point, I should remind you, the Marut is a CR-25 monster. That is one higher than an ancient red dragon, and just one under Demogorgon. Its AC and its hit points are very high. It has a number of different resistances, immunities, and legendary resistance. It can plane shift itself at will. It can make two slam attacks that each automatically hit and deal 60 force damage apiece. It can emit a 60 foot cube of radiance that deals 45 radiant damage automatically and each creature in the area must succeed on a DC 20 wisdom saving throw or be stunned until the Marut's end of next turn. Once per rest, it can target up to two creatures who must succeed on DC 20 charisma saves or be teleported along with the Marut to the Hall of Concordance and Sigil. So, wow. Chugging along out of the flames of hell is another incredible and intense construct, the Hellfire Engine. I actually already covered this one in my Devil's Ranking, but technically it is a construct and I also wanted to reevaluate it just slightly, so I don't want to leave it out here in the actual construct ranking. This is a giant infernal construct. It's semi-intelligent. It's a war machine created for doom and destruction. All of its attacks are about as badass as it gets. It can run over and crush enemies, shoot huge sprays of bone-melting acid, lash with a lightning flail, and fire a thunder cannon. The Hellfire Engine is also a soul trap, for when it slays someone, the foe's soul is sent to the River Styx, arriving as a Lemure. This particularly strikes me, as I'm not quite sure, how devils can claim a mortal soul just like that. Even the soul of, let's say, a noble-hearted champion who devoutly served a good-aligned god. That seems to defy the very fabric of existence. A breaking down of the law of the cosmos. Not only does that seem impossible, but also quite unlike devils who obey laws very strictly, as corrupt as they might be. The Hellfire Engine's versatility is pretty low, and it would be even lower, but every once in a while one of them goes berserk, it breaks loose, and wreaks havoc outside of its typical narrow patterns. Despite a couple hiccups in the Hellfire Engine, it's a darkly evocative creature, and whenever I look at it I always remember Mr. Bone Stripper from Nothing But Trouble. In the aftermath of a great battle, heavy footsteps approach. Thump, thump, thump. Through the haze, a massive construct appears, impaling cadavers upon its spiked armor. The cadaver collector is by far one of the coolest constructs and really just freaky as hell. Lore states that the Cadaver Collectors were created long ago by masters on Asheron, a plane of infinite battles where warmongering gods clash their armies upon floating iron land masses. But of course, a number of Cadaver Collectors are sent into the world of mortals, particularly wherever wars and battles rage. They scour for choice specimens, as well as weapons, armor, and other objects. In combat, a Cadaver Collector has three main offensive modes. Powerful Fist Slams, a potent Paralyzing Gas, and Enslaved Spectres of the Dead it has harvested, reanimated by the necromantic magic flowing through the construct. 
The combination of mighty attacks and grisly style makes the Cadaver Collector a very worthy upper tier entry. Personally, I do very much prefer the 3E and 4E Cadaver Collector art over the 5E version, and I expounded upon that recently in my video about D&D art that was better before 5E. The Warforged is an iconic race from the Eberron setting and one of the defining elements that made Eberron a success. It is a living creature, it has living organic matter at its core, but it's covered in protective plating and infused with special life-giving magical processes. Warforged are good for pretty much any class, and they are by far the most versatile type of creature in this construct ranking. They are sentient beings after all. They have resistance against poison damage and advantage on saving throws versus the poison condition. Like all constructs, they do not have to eat, drink, or breathe. They're immune to disease, and they do not sleep, nor can magic put them to sleep. In order to take a long rest, they go into an inactive state for six hours, during which they're still aware of the surroundings. I did like how 3E handled the Warforged plating better, both from a mechanics and a narrative standpoint. You essentially chose what heaviness of plating you were built with. Plus, there were a couple enhancement feat options that you could take only at first levels, like Mithril Plating or Adamantine Plating. Now in 5e, the Warforge just gets plus one to AC, and they wear armor, like everyone else. Technically, they incorporate the armor into their plating, but that's just weird. I mean, if you simply look at all the Warforged artwork we've always had, obviously they're built with plating as part of their body from the get-go. They also have a trait called Specialized Design, which gives proficiency with one skill and one tool. None of the Warforged traits are exactly exciting. They're all basically passive benefits, but they are effective and they're broadly applicable to about any class. The Warforged lacks the natural beauty and the classic aesthetics of races like human and elf, but there is something interesting about the Warforged style. Somewhere between sci-fi and fantasy, almost a golem but not, a little bit steampunk, and we could think of the endless modification to the Warforged body. It's memorable, it's unique, they did a great job. Role-playing is a mixed bag. On the one hand, their emotions are more limited compared to a typical person, so that makes it a bit more narrow, a bit more dry, or maybe monotone. But on the other hand, they have this built-in motivation of finding their identity and their place in the world. Lore for the Warforged is compelling. It gives you a solid story and a hook for you to either play off of or subvert, as the Warforged were created to be soldiers in a great war. The Great War. But now, what do you do? It's over. You're wandering the world as a what? The Warforged is a great race, though it could have been even better. The Eidolon is a creature that I find very interesting, as it fills a role rarely ever seen in D&D, that of the Spirit. 5e categorizes this as an undead, and the sacred statues that it can inhabit are constructs. But I could make the argument that it's really not an undead. Like, undead in D&D, are classically defined as being powered by negative energy. It's a reversal of, or a mockery of, life. But the Eidolon is not that. It's the soul of someone who fervently served a god in life, and after his body died, the soul takes up an honored role as a temple protector, a guardian spirit. There's no negative energy involved, no necromancy, no twisted spirit that can't find rest and wants to drain the living's energy. We could also think of other spirits, such as primal spirits, the spirits of nature, trees, rivers, animals, even honored ancestors that protected the world from outsiders, from extraplanar entities that are constantly wanting to invade. There's no creature type for this in 5e, so the Eidolon is stuck as undead, and it's one of the very, very few undead that is not evil. It can be any alignment. The Eidolon is not very powerful in and of itself. It has some good resistances and immunities, but its AC and hit points are very low. It cannot deal any damage in spirit form, 
but rather emanate a big radius of divine dread that sends intruders and would-be temple looters fleeing in terror. However, it's one of those effects that once someone saves from it or it just times out, the target gains immunity to the divine dread for 24 hours, so it's not that great. The incorporeal Eidolon spirit can enter sacred statues, which are large constructs that are inert statues when they're not being inhabited. In construct form, now the creature can deal damage, either with slam attacks or thrown rocks, and those slams can deal a lot of damage. It's up to the DM how many sacred statues are present in a given location, and unfortunately Mordenkainen's tome gives no guidelines at all, just referencing that there are usually several at a site. So this monster is really unique, it's full of storytelling potential, and I like the tactical dynamics of the fear effect at the beginning, followed by the spirit flitting into these pummeling statues, but on the other hand, we have the vagueness, the overall lack of options. Either the spirit form uses its fear radius, which will only work for so long, or the statue just makes basic slams or rock throws. If only this creature had a bit more, like one more offensive ability in each of its forms. Perhaps something thematic from the cleric spell list while in spirit form, maybe bestow curse or banishment then maybe a fire ability while in the statue form. The artwork shows a burning brazier, and it clearly harkens back to the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Maybe the statue form can set fire traps on the fly. I could think of so many options. Also, its role-playing potential could be great, but given the description in the book, it doesn't seem particularly conversational or into philosophical debates, just a guardian. This creature should have made A tier, and it gets so, so close, but it just doesn't have quite enough. These are the sorts of things that bug me, and it's why I wanted to create my Emporium of Esoterica book, to give the monsters a little something extra to make them more dynamic in combat. I want them to lend themselves a bit better to role-playing, to storytelling. Well, my brave companions, that concludes B tier and the entire Construct's ranking. That's right, not a single one made it above B tier. I wish there were some higher slotted entries, but 5e just has not delivered on it yet. Constructs serve a great place in D&D, and I am grateful. I'm so glad to have them there. Wouldn't feel complete without them. But to get some more interesting storytelling and role-playing interactions involved, you usually have to get the Constructs master into the scene as well not just the construct itself. There are exceptions, like the Warforged, but really no entry had it great all around. Thanks a ton for your patience with this ranking video. I'm also going to be making a new top 10 monster video very soon, so look out for that. In the meantime, check out my Kickstarter for Esper's Emporium of Esoterica and get your copy on reserve. I greatly appreciate your support, and I hope to enrich your own games and fantasy worlds. Farewell for now, you tinkers and artificers. May your adventures be many.